what it is not common to come across is a Beaumont paper dress from the 60s. So it is from DHJ Industries, still in its original packaging. Check out that print. I've heard of paper dresses, but I've never seen them sold like in a little kit or bag like this. So it's got the original signage. I don't know if it's the original bag, but uh, it's a size medium. Well, if you got a dollar, well, just lousy down. You know that I got rhythm that could suit your budget found. Hey, this is Patrick with Trusty Huckster Mercantile. Welcome to my channel. I'm going to do a little bit of an intro here for some shop along video that I was able to capture on my last road trip, uh, which I did as part of my day job. I did a trip through primarily Missouri, uh, but did a little pop into uh, Kansas and then up through Iowa. And I, uh, I want to say I've got clips from all of those maybe. Uh, and then I also have some haul video, which I will throw in at the end. So I just want to do a quick intro. Uh, if you're not familiar with Trusty Huckster Mercantile, I am a vintage reseller. Uh, so everything you're going to see uh, in the upcoming Shop With Me videos will be, I think in all cases of the clips that you're about to see, these are all from quote unquote, antique stores or antique malls. I didn't really have a lot of opportunity during this trip between appointments to get into you know, the Goodwills or the thrift stores. So these are a little bit more traditional, but I I did find some things for myself, but I found a lot of things for resale. So it's always good to keep that in mind. Even when you're going into a traditional curated antique mall, there will be items that you can pick up because sometimes sellers it's something they don't specialize in. They picked it up inexpensively and they're just trying to move it on. Uh, so if you keep your eyes peeled, you can get some good deals. So here are uh, some of the Shop With Me clips uh, starting in Missouri and then working my way throughout the week uh, ending. I believe the last clip will be ending in Iowa. Uh, enjoy and I'll be right back. One of the things I like exploring in antique shops is just the idea of seeing something that probably was once really common, but now you just never come across. And this is a perfect example. It's a, a kind of industrial. I mean, I am in a rural community, so like maybe something to do with farms. So, you know, as a good antique shop will do, it's going to mark what the item is and as it says, it's a cream separator. So, you know, pretty much in a farming community. Now, is it worth 110 bucks? I have absolutely no idea, but it's a pretty cool, large scale, almost sculpture that would definitely be a topic of conversation to someone visiting your not so rural home. This is actually something I've come across before and seeing it for the first time again, I really couldn't remember what it was. And so this is something that's neat when you find an item that also has its original packaging. Because no, it is not uh, something to separate the fringe on your rug. It has nothing to do with your hair. It is a cake breaker. And I don't really know what the benefit of a cake breaker is versus a knife, but it's a no messy crumbling of frosting or filling. So I guess it doesn't crush the frosting. I don't know. Uh, but you know, it's nothing I'm going to pick up, but it is kind of cool because again, you find things that you don't see every day and you can learn a little bit more about them at your local antique store. Sometimes you see things and just really have no idea. When you open it up, you start getting maybe a little idea, general shape. But when you're really lucky, you get new old stock that has tags. Head net mosquito. Now this is saying M1944, but I did look this up and it does appear that whether it was issued in 1944 or not, this is a World War II mosquito net um, piece with instructions. Something a little different in the middle of Missouri. A little while ago, I did a show and tell on uh, Vintage and Vinyl's channel with Katie about a collection of cake toppers that I had, and I showed some wedding cake toppers. And it was always fun to try and figure out what era the bride and groom were from and, you know, wh whatever. This one, though, I feel is more noteworthy because it appears that 
the bride and groom decided to set the cake on fire. So I'm sure it's just something from age, but uh, this is almost destined for a Halloween display as opposed to the next wedding bride and groom cake topper display. So falling in the category of you don't know what you need until you see it, super cool keyboard, well, board for keys. Uh, looks like this is primarily, you know, that late 60s, early, well, it's got to be early 70s because there's 1971 is on here. But what it includes is some of the blanks. So back in the day, when you had different keys for the ignition and for the trunk, you had to start with a blank. Now these aren't looking like blanks. So it says it includes blanks, but I'm not sure that that's what this includes. But 85 cents to get your uh, key made, gonna cost a lot more than that to get your keys made now. Guess it's a central Missouri thing, cause here's another one. They have a great selection of industrial, um, but what I wanted to highlight here, which I thought was kind of cool, cause I've never seen so much in one place, it's the displays. So, Cassite, your car runs better, or double your money back. So you got the display rack plus the cans, and they've got the cans tied into it so people can't buy those separately. And then there's uh, Conoco, Conoco, uh, looks like oil, the so cans of oil in that display, and then a Gulf oil display piece. Uh, looks like that's not part of it. Vans Boot Saver, looks cool, but that looks like it's just sitting on top. So, you know, some great industrial pieces, um, you know, loving that rusty and crusty, but really cool. The huckster in me loves the sales display stuff. I don't come across fairy lamps very often, but I know they're very popular in the vintage community. And this is probably one of the most diverse collections I'd ever seen. And there's Fenton, there's a lot of these were marked. A lot of these are individually priced. They're priced at their full value. Uh, so I didn't pick anything up, but it is actually kind of nice to see the variety that becomes available uh, for those that are really trying to collect and, and build um, that style or that type of personal collection. In an ongoing effort to save the trunk down elephants, we are on a search for trunk down elephants, which are relatively few and far between. We've got one in the bookends, but for 30 bucks, he can save himself. None in the jewelry. None in the pewter. And I wanna say I saw there's one there in the back. And then the little blue one. And then the soapstone. Um, napkin rings and there's a little wooden one in the back and then that one looks like his trunk is snapped off so i'm not sure he counts but so looking to save the elephants not that many around to be saved Recently, I sold a Hager piece, Royal Hager, signed by Royal Hickman of a pigeon, and it was in this mauve agate uh, glaze. So when I saw this piece, I immediately thought it was Hager because it had the same glaze. But what I was surprised to find is it's actually this Gonder uh, pottery from Zanesville, Ohio. And I only would have known that because it still has its original foil label in situ because the bottom was not marked at all. And so that's just something to be aware of that although this looks Hager, the glaze definitely looks Hager, it's not Hager. And if someone had actually cleaned that label off, you would have no idea whose piece this actually was. Well, this is something you don't see every day outside your friendly neighborhood antique store. A little, uh, Kind of little airstream. All done up inside to your vintage lifestyle content. Little vintage inspired window treatments. All set up for some card games. And of course, everything is for sale. Can't have a camper without some Tupperware. 
and some postcards that you can send on your travels. Cute little setup here in Missouri. Pretty common to come across sewing stuff in an antique shop. What it is not common to come across is a Beaumont paper dress from the 60s. So it is from DHJ Industries, still in its original packaging. Check out that print. I've heard of paper dresses, but I've never seen them sold like in a little kit or bag like this. So it's got the original signage. I don't know if it's the original bag, but uh, it's a size medium and it can be yours for 75 bucks. It's been a while since I've come across a good selection of Viking and swung glass, but here it is. Nice. As a huckster, sometimes the sales pieces, uh, point of sale displays are the best. And here is a great Super Suds, which actually seems kind of like a made up thing, but it must have been a real uh, product because you can write the price uh, at the store level, how much the large size cost and how much the giant size cost. So pretty cool piece, 75 bucks, worth all of its money, leaving it behind, but always nice to see how a huckster hucks. Look at that. It's not made up. I have heard of Burma Shade road signs, but I admit I don't think I've ever seen them. And so here's a full set. Drinking drivers, nothing worse. They put the court before the hearse. Burma Shave. And the full set is 2500 bucks. I've never seen one before, so probably a good price. And uh, think of how great this would look in your bar. As promised, I am back with a little bit of a haul video to go along with those shop with me's. Uh, pretty much, well, actually everything I'm going to show you here is new. Uh, nothing that I videotaped did I actually end up purchasing that I'm going to show you here. So this will all be kind of for the first time you're seeing it. And a couple different categories. I'm not showing you everything that I picked up. Uh, because I do a lot of live sales, I do mystery boxes as part of my live sales here on my channel, Thursday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I picked up some things that'll get dropped into the mystery boxes and, you know, some things that are just for my personal collection or, you know, nothing, not, things that maybe wouldn't be as interesting. So I'm really just going to highlight some of the items that I'll either be selling on eBay or Etsy or possibly in my live sales. And there's a couple of items that I think are kind of fun that I probably will end up putting into some of my mystery boxes, but I still wanted to show them because they were kind of cool. And this falls into that category. A lot of what I pick up at antique malls is ephemera because in some cases the booth, uh, the person that has the booth will package a lot of different small pieces of ephemera together like little cookbooks or, you know, different things. So instead of selling them individually one at a time, they just sell them at, you know, a good price when you break them up. And so I, I guess I'm kind of on the lookout for those. So I do. I found out quite, I found quite a lot of ephemera uh, during this trip, including a lot that included these decals. Now, admittedly, these were all kind of packaged together, and this one was sitting on top. So this is the Meyercord decals, which Meyercord, I can't say I really know a lot about them, but it was a name that I did know, and the fact that it was packaged together, I think they knew that this was kind of the eye candy to the lot. Uh, so I, this was on top, but there was a bunch of other stuff mixed in that was hard to see, but you could see that there were actually multiple pieces available. Now, what it turned out is none of the other pieces were Meyercord, but there were some other great pieces that were still absolutely worth picking up that are all some really great pieces of vintage. Now, the Meyercord doesn't have any date or any reference to when uh, it was it was made. So, you know, based on the looks, we're probably in the 50s, I would assume. And the rest of these, now admittedly, you know, some of these I would have thought were a little bit older because kind of that looks like a butler and those look like bowler hats. I would have guessed that's more of a 30s piece, 
But my favorite uh, trick to looking at uh, when things are published, you've got the zip code on the back of these. These are not the Meyer cord. These are the Duro decals. Uh, it shows that there is a uh, two-digit zip code, which means it was released between 1948 and 1963. So the design might be older, the design might be from the 30s, but that these renditions of them were a little bit later. So there are a lot of different you know, pieces in there. There was the little French maid and the cook. There were um, some Southwest pieces that kind of went with the other one. There was a, another a version of a butler that was a little bit bigger. So, you, you know, all those, once I divided it up, the per price piece of each set of labels wasn't all that expensive that I can either sell them as a set or, you know, maybe pair a couple up or sell them individually or even just drop them into a mystery box because they're just kind of fun. And I think people that like that aesthetic, it's just kind of a fun item to have this new old stock, these decals that were never used uh, with their original uh, release publishing information on the back. Uh, some of the other things I tend to pick up in lots or sealed bags that are in these uh, booths, and I think, this, I think this came from the same place, are uh, recipe books. So like this one was just like a random uh, Roquefort cheese recipe book. Uh, and then this one I, I thought was kind of cool. It was actually a Sweet and Low uh, packet. Uh, so this, the, the book itself, I don't, that one, I don't think, yeah, it did have a date. This one is from 1965. The material was copyrighted in 1965. So this probably came out, you know, late 60s. The little pamphlet didn't have uh, a date on it. But, you know, I think this was released with the, all these recipes around the time probably the Sweet and Low was making its introduction to let people know this is what you could do with it other than just throwing it into a drink. So if you wanted to make a rhubarb pie for 25 calories per cup, you can figure out how to do it by making it with Sweet and Low. So I did. I actually picked up several cookbooks that were in there. I just threw out throwing a couple of them because again, it's just a fun way to pick up some ephemera that the package, you know, isn't particularly expensive, but then when you open it up and there's multiple pieces inside, the price per item is, you know, usually a pretty good price that I can then, again, toss it into a mystery box or combine a couple of them together into little theme packets like the Sweet and Low set and uh, have a fun, inexpensive item to sell, again, in one of my live sales. Uh, this one is something I might uh, put onto my Etsy or my eBay. You know, I'll have to do a little bit of research on it because it's a card game, but it's a card game issued by Berlitz to learn French. And this one, again, uh, I don't know if it, it specifically had a uh, copyright date on it, but it still had a single-digit zip code, so it was between 1948 and 1963. Uh, but most importantly, it includes the instructions of how to play because what you get are in the cards, you know, kind of a cool graphic on the card, but the cards themselves really just are the numbers with words. So I haven't read the instructions yet, admittedly, uh, but I don't know, so I don't know if you're, if it's like playing rummy, but you're trying to play it with words, because like here's a number one uh, that says salt, R, and this one is number one, is. Oh, we got R and is. So maybe, that, maybe that's related. Maybe that's, like, like, maybe that's how you learn your verbs, by doing things with the number one. I have no idea. But if I wanted to know, I have the instructions. So, you know, this is just one of those cool things that I think if it's... If there's a market for it, you know, I might put it up on eBay or Etsy, uh, but if not, it's something that goes into a live sales, just kind of a fun item because I picked it up at a decent price and there would be people that would like those cards either for package toppers or maybe even to learn French because you have the instructions and you know how to do that. Probably my favorite item that I picked up on this trip, at least in the ephemera world, is this book on patents. So it's issued by Munn & Company, which is a law firm. Yeah, out of New York, and they are patent attorneys. And it literally is a book. There's a little foreword in here. It's literally a book that's written for their clients to say, here's what you need to know when you're applying for a patent. And it's got all of these great graphics and illustrations and photographs throughout it of you know what their law firm was like, what you need to know, what our office does, some great examples of patents. This book is published, copyrighted 1927. So it's a fairly nondescript book, but the contents inside of it, I just think are super fascinating for anyone involved in the, that engineering, you know, anything of that patent world. You know, this is just a fun 
item that again might end up on my Etsy store because I think it's a little bit more specialized, but who knows? Maybe it'll end up on my live sale because I have fun selling things there too. Uh, similarly, another kind of a specialty item, but I was super excited to get it. In general, I don't think there's a huge need for calendars uh, from past years. Some people might want them if they happen to, maybe it's the year of their birth or something like that. But this happens to be a 1962 calendar from the Met. And check out every, it's a weekly calendar, and every week has different art included. So, you know, this is one of those cases that because there's not a huge need or a huge market for a calendar from 1962, this is one of those items that would be screaming for either for junk journaling or someone who maybe has their own way to cutting mats, doing custom mats. Cut these out. You have absolutely beautiful Metropolitan Museum of Art card stock uh, images that you could sell and frame you know, or frame for yourself or resell them. Um, and again, I just picked it up at it for a really reasonable price that I think that to the right person, this could just be really cool to study the art because of course it is the Met. So every item that you have actually has information on who did it, what year it's from, there's quotes that go along with it. And the calendar itself is in absolutely pristine condition, just not particularly usable as a calendar. So, but that was a fun one. And it even has still its box. So I thought that was kind of cool. And a personal uh, item of personal interest to me, this is something, the Tournament of Roses Parade is something that I would look forward to every year. Admittedly, I've kind of drifted away from it a little bit lately, um, but as a family, as our daughter was growing up, we would sit there and that would be like, that would be our, our, our I was not into this, the um, Rose Bowl itself. I really still don't care about sports, but the parade and some of the things that they do with the floats, I always found fascinating. And so this is a pictorial guide of the 1965 Tournament of Roses parade. And it actually has images of the floats of what they were doing back in 1965. Now, those are back black and white. Yeah, but there are actually some photographs that are in color as well. So you do have some color photo, you do have some color ads. You know, again, 1965, so we're late in the you know mid-century modern era, but just check out some of the architecture, you know, for the bank that's sponsoring it, um, the mirror glaze polish, I and mean, just check out that car. I mean, just the stuff that's in here is just a great snapshot in time that even if you're not hugely into the the floats or into the parade itself, there's just some the great items, you know, throughout the entire magazine that, you know, hey, even if you like the sports aspect of it, you've got the information on the sporting, the Michigan and Oregon State were playing that year. Um, ads, you know, again, you just got a great little time capsule of 1965 that is uh, absolutely worthy of preserving. And then the last item that I felt in the ephemeral world anyway, the last item that I felt worthy of preserving was another certificate. Now, a certificate, I say another certificate because if you've followed my channel before, you know that I actually have a, I have a, a collection of um, st old stock certificates that uh, from when I used to work for a company that sold locomotive equipment parts, I had a personal collection of railway stock certificates. And there is a market for them. They sell fairly regularly for me on Etsy. And I've also offered them once in a while on my YouTube because I just have fun selling them. This is something I'd never seen before. So this one does say it is still Railroadiana. So it's a Railway Education, Redway, Railway Educational Association. And what this was, was effectively a diploma for Elmer Cook showing that he had completed the coursework for basically for beginning to be uh, for fireman's for fireman's preparatory instruction. So he graduated the fireman's preparatory instruction, which uh, including the signals governing train movements, the combustion of coal, the economical firing of anthracite and bituminous coal and oil fuel in locomotive operating and economical boiler feeding. Now, I was unaware that that was something you actually got a certificate of completion or maybe even a degree in, but this was something that in 1917, Elmer Cook completed his certification, got his certificate, and somebody in the family kept it because it's just a cool snapshot. Unfortunately, someone in the family got rid of it, and now I have it picked up, 
And for someone who just loves real Rodiana, this I think is fairly unique. I tried to find it online and I couldn't find an example. So it, it kind of looks like a stock certificate. It's got a great image of a steam locomotive on the top. Um, it's just kind of a cool piece. Then you throw on top of it that this was issued in the middle of World War I. Um, you know, Elmer was, you know, did not go off to fight to war. He actually learned a, learned a, a career path. And here's the proof. So I thought that was a fun item, and uh, that'll probably end up on my um, Etsy channel, but you need to do a little bit of research. So if you know anything about these, I would definitely appreciate uh, additional information, but I just thought that was really cool and absolutely worthy of saving from going into a landfill. An area that I've been trying to educate myself on a little bit more uh, because I know it is popular in the vintage world is the idea of this whole rusty, crusty, and dusty, uh, this industrial uh, look. And I do have, you know, there's some aspect of my own aesthetic that I like the dark, I like the, the industrial look, but I tend not to get in. I, I, have, I have such a high focus on condition, I tend to steer clear of things from my personal collection that would be considered rusty or crusty. You can wipe off the dust, but you know, so there's, there's just a little bit of different market of what's good, what's bad. And one of the things that I came across, and this is something that I will have to say, it seems somewhat regional. I have never seen an oil can like this uh, here in the Chicago area, but I found probably a dozen of these going through Missouri and Kansas. So I don't know if it's just because the places I was going to, you know, were more, they had a little bit more of the industrial. And when I come go to places around here, maybe I'm not seeing it, I have no idea. I don't think these are particularly valuable, but I thought it was a very cool form and looked, I really liked the shape of this. You know, this was just something that because of the nozzle and the handle being the, the angles that they were in, I just thought that moved this to a whole different level of like almost like industrial art that you would have this sitting, it would just look cool. It would be a conversation piece in and of itself. And that's what I think a lot of people like that industrial look for. You know, you don't have a real need for pulleys or chains or, you know, heavy duty tools but you put them you know, on the side or hang them on the wall and suddenly people look at those and go, oh my God, that's so cool. Where did you get that? What is that? And I think that kind of fits the, it fits the bill for this one too. So definitely picked up one of those. And then, you know, maybe not quite into the rusty crusty, but getting into still metal work, I picked up a pencil case. So this one is for Wallace Invader pencils uh, from St. Louis, Missouri, because I did pick this up in Missouri. I hope I hold it up right. So, Invader and then Wallace pencils and you can see their address now this one doesn't include a zip code But you know because it was on the box it may not have needed the zip code. So maybe it predates 1948 I'm thinking it is but I haven't done any research on Wallace yet So this is just one of those. It's not quite rusty, but it's not quite pristine either um, there's definitely a little bit of oxidation on the inside. Definitely not crusty, and I, I, I'll make sure I wipe the dust off so it's not dusty. But into that industrial design, like this is just one of those cool pieces that one, it is functional. It's a pencil box, so if you need, if you want to hold your pens and pencils, cool way to do it. Um, but this ends up being just one of those cool items that, because of its shape, the fact that it's long, you can prop it upright. It can kind of sit low in front of some tall things behind it. Um, you know, prop it open if you want to display things inside of it. Just kind of a cool little item that I don't pick these up very often. So when I found one at a good price, I thought this was kind of fun. This will probably just end up in a live sale uh, because I don't think there's a huge value to something like this um, to justify going onto eBay or Etsy, taking pictures and all that fun stuff. But I definitely think there's a market for it and I think uh, you'll probably end up seeing it on an upcoming live sale. Just going to highlight a couple of other things that I picked up along the way uh, that are just of personal interest to me. Uh, and some of them I actually don't even know what I'm going to be doing with them yet, including this one. This is a little black glass box. I'm going to say black glass. I'm not going to say black amethyst because when I held it up, I only see black. I do not see any purple, um, but whatever you want to refer to it with a little elephant on the top that has his trunk down. If you've been watching my channel, you know that Katie from Vintage at Vinyl and I are on a crusade to provide love to the trunk down elephants. Thumbs up for trunk down. 
and uh, he was a perfect little example of that. So I picked him up. He's just a little trinket box. I haven't even cleaned him up yet, so his, the lid's still taped on. But I did actually take the tape off during in the store, and I didn't care if anyone tried to stop me. Um, I did take the tape off just to make sure that the lid, that there were no you know big chips or anything missing from either the top of the base or in the lid, and it's actually in great condition. So I was uh, able to pick him up. He doesn't appear to be marked. You know, so there's no uh, maker's mark stamped into the glass. So I'm hoping, I haven't tried to Google Lens him yet, so I'm hoping I might try to figure out who would have issued this. You know, was this a Cambridge item? Was this Imperial? Um, I'm hoping it is a um, a named company that uh, I'll have a little bit of luck finding additional information on. But even if I don't, he was absolutely worth grabbing because thumbs up for Trump down. And uh, another item that I picked up, now this is building a personal collection. So this one is not for sale, uh, but this is, I, I'm in the process of expanding my collection of punch boards and I'm planning a display for those. And as part of that, I've discovered, I found a couple of banks that I liked and I decided I wanted to get additional lithogra uh, lithography, tin lithography banks. And I came across this one, which I really liked. And one of the reasons I really liked it, one, I do like the shape, you know, I like the form. I like the graphics that are on there. And you do a little bit of research to figure out the era, but I mean, based on the bus that's uh, showing in the background there and the train on here, I mean, I'm thinking this is like 30s or 40s. Uh, hopefully it's not a reproduction, but it is German made. And I know that because, and one of the reasons I liked it is because it does include the combination to the lock. There are banks that are available online fairly regularly, and they can be relatively inexpensive, but if you look at the descriptions, you'll discover they don't have a key, or if they're combination locks, they don't you don't know the combination. So the fact that this one actually has the combination included actually does increase its value. And I will say, this is one of the most expensive items I picked up on this trip, but because I'm picking it up for myself, I didn't have a problem to do that. So it has the slot in the back the combination in the front. And I thought it was a very cool item, cool shape. And at some point, maybe once I get them displayed or as I as I build up more of the collection, I'll, I'll spend more time talking about and showing the banks that I'm picking up along the way. But this was probably, I did pick up a few on this trip. This is by far my favorite. Uh, and so I definitely wanted to show that as part of this haul video. So that's all I'm going to cover right now. I had a couple other things I pulled out to show, but I can already tell that these little extra segments from the haul video are getting a little long. Uh, so I'll just kind of stop there. If you want to see more, pop into some of my live sales. Make sure you follow me on eBay or Etsy uh, so you can see when I post new things onto the stores there. And you'll be able to see all of the items that I pick up for resale uh, from these trips. And also, let's be honest, from a bunch of old trips that I haven't yet posted everything yet. It happens. So if you've gotten this far into the video and you've been enjoying it, I really hope you consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't already. Uh, also giving the video a thumbs up if you haven't already. Comment, share it with your friends, whatever you might do. I definitely appreciate that because I do recognize uh, when that happens and YouTube recognizes it and then puts my videos in front of more people. So when you do stuff like that, it does actually help video creators such as myself making sure that the content gets in front of other people that like content similar to those. Basically, if you like it, maybe they'll like it too. So Appreciate you joining me. I uh, appreciate you me giving your time and appreciate you putting your trust in Trusty Huckster. I will talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Well, show me a sign if you're wishing me to stay. Otherwise, I say goodbye and finish out the day. And that sunrise in the morning and you got nothing to say. Oh, that's when I'll be headed on my way.